This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. I'll introduce uh, Professor Everett. Um, he received his PhD in art history and archaeology at the University of Missouri, which is how I know him. Uh, he's a specialist in Renaissance and Baroque art and architecture, and especially uh, uh, the artist architect John Lorenzo Bernini, uh, as well as uh, cities and urbanism, both of uh, which are topics he's published on exclusively at Creighton University. I forgot to mention he's an associate professor at Creighton University. Uh, he also teaches on urbanism and uh, uh, the history of cities and architectural history as well. Uh, and uh, although he's not a numismatist per se, he certainly has published uh, numismatic articles, and you'll hear him today talk about papal medals. But uh, if you're interested in his numismatic work, I'm just going to read off a, a couple of citations of articles for you. Uh, pressing Metal, uh, Pressing Politics, Papal Annual Medals, 1605 to 1700 in religions 2016 and then of course the annual medals of per pope o urban the eighth barberini in the american journal of numismatics 2013 so with that i'll hand it over to Matt. uh well thank you nathan uh thanks for the invitation i'm very happy uh to be here uh, yeah, and so today we thought we'd talk about some of that, talk about some of these annual medals from the uh, 17th century, and think about Bernini uh, and his role. Uh, as Nathan said, I'm not a numismatist, yes, uh, but I am interested in the images that appear on the, uh, on the um, on medals, uh, and so we sort of have that uh, intersection there with uh, images and architecture. So if I can, let me start sharing the screen. Uh, is everyone seeing? We have all your slides at the moment. Okay. There we go. Yeah, perfect. I got it. All right. Uh, so Bernini, Rome and Numismatic Art. The history of early modern Rome is in many ways a story of architecture. With the return of the papacy to Rome in, uh, in 1417, uh, Pope Martin V found the city in a dismal state and resolved to fix it with what he termed noble edifices, thus permanently linking the papacy to the architecture and urbanism of the eternal city. This grand project was completed uh, 250 years later, under Alexander VII, along with his architectural impresario, John Lorenzo Bernini. The transformation of Rome was recorded on papal medals, which were commonly produced, distributed, and collected by elites across Europe, uh, indicating medals' importance. A dozen of Bernini's architectural projects appear on papal medals in various iterations, and this frequent appearance of Bernini's architecture suggests the centrality of his work in the image of Rome projected by the papacy to the elites of Europe. This paper considers depictions of Bernini's architectural projects that appear on papal commemorative medals in order to examine the substance and dissemination of Bernini's fame. At the same time, this paper documents the role Bernini uh, played in papal programs of prestige architecture and performative urbanism. Few individuals have had as large an impact on the architectural appearance of Rome as John Lorenzo Bernini. Over the course of his some 60 years of artistic output, he built churches, fountains, monuments, and tombs. As his son and biographer Domenico put it, this work rendered his father glorious and celebrated throughout the world. Um, Yet other than Bernini's works themselves, there is little commemoration of the artist among the vast number of monuments in the city uh, beyond the house of his youth near Santa Maria Maggiore, the Casa Bernini, and his own obscure tomb in Santa Maria Maggiore. Uh, from where, sadly, 
uh, his bones have already gone missing. Even before his death, his fame was fading. Despite familial efforts to preserve his fame, which included compiling the information that ultimately constituted biographies by uh, Filippo Baldinucci and the aforementioned son, Domenico Bernini, his pursuit of fame was always an essential concern for illustrious artists, with the literary tradition stretching back to the likes of Giorgio Vasari, Baldassare Castiglione, uh, Antonio Manetti, and even Giovanni Boccaccio. Bernini's biographers uh, relate that Bernini's desire for fame emerged when he was just 10 years old during a, an audience with uh, Pope Paul V. Uh, in that meeting, he was awarded 12 gold coins uh, for expertly rendering uh, a head. Thereafter, the young artist tire tirelessly dedicated himself to the attainment of glory uh, through the study of the arts uh, and set him on a lifelong journey to become the Michelangelo of his age. Contemporary accounts about Bernini insist uh, that he was one of the most famous men in Europe. Bernini's fame outside of Rome was spread in many ways, including a VC letters and guidebooks. Visitors to Rome returning to their homes with stories and vedute and some works by Bernini that actually left Italy. But commemorative slides also spread Bernini's fame uh, as a dozen of uh, his uh, architectural projects appear on papal medals in various iterations. Uh, here we're looking at a medal from 1669 announcing Pope Clement IX's uh, project to place Bernini's angels on the Pont San Angelo. The medals were struck in gold, silver, or bronze, and generally ranged in size from 30 to 45 um, millimeters. The images produced in numismatic art constitute an overlooked yet revealing resource. Studies of architectural representations on coinage has in the past tended to be focused on reconstruction uh, on reconstructing the appearance of lost or unrealized architecture. But as Nathan Elkins recently uh, pointed out in his monograph on uh, ancient coinage, uh, he encourages a new look at numismatic architecture, one that uh, looks at, quote, the context of the patron's wider ideological or visual program as deployed on coinage. The production of commemorative medals is a common papal practice with the tradition probably beginning under Pope Nicholas V, who revived the ancient Roman custom. Uh, we're looking uh, here at what is thought to be the first uh, papal medal from about 1455, which depicts the Navicella. Recipients of these medals included Vatican employees, elite pilgrims, and visiting dignitaries. Thousands of individual medals were issued by the papacy in the 17th century, uh, as did other European elites, all of which indicates the widespread production and importance of medals. Subsequent restrikes of medals uh, could continue for years after the original series was issued, inflating the numbers of medals in circulation uh, even more. Medals were widely collected and their display was a matter of some prestige. John Evelyn, the famous English visitor to 17th century Rome, consistently and repeatedly described in his diary uh, the metal collections owned by the important people uh, he visited um, in Italy. Evelyn notes that the metals uh, collections owned by, uh, Evelyn notes that the metals were considered most necessary to libraries as they depicted uh, lost architecture, and he consistently encountered learned men who were always consulting and comparing reverses of medals uh, and medallions. Once in Rome, vivid, uh, Evelyn vividly described a visit in February 1656 to the markets in Piazza Navona where he, uh, where medals were regularly sold. 
Evelyn's comments about metal collecting are instructive. First, it is clear that the elites of Europe wanted metals and that metals delivered information in a manner akin to books. Viewing metals in this way demonstrates that they were presented as an opportunity to deliver specific messages to the elite of Europe. Collectors were keen to have solid metal collections, to display them with some pomp, and, to, and in general to compete with other collectors. Meanwhile, papal production of commemorative medals ramps up through the 1600s to meet, de to meet demand. At the beginning of the century, Paul V introduced, uh, I'm sorry, produced about 100 series in 16 years as Pope. A few decades later, Alexander VII would produce almost 200 series in just 10 years. In part, this increase was driven by recognition of the propagandistic potential of metals. This is suggested by an unusual step that Pope Urban VIII undertook in 1632. Urban began acquiring the dyes for his metals and prohibiting the dispersal of other papal dyes. Uh, previously, uh, metalists were permitted to keep the dyes and continue to strike the metals. In maintaining possession of the dyes, Urban prevented unauthorized restrikes and thus controlled the production and distribution of his medals and their messages. A central purpose of papal medals, therefore, was to release timely messages to other elite powers. This paper focuses mostly on the so-called annual medal. Annual medals are a unique iteration of papal commemorative medals, and they celebrate an important papal achievement from the preceding year. Their timeliness makes them valuable sources to gauge the perceived success of the papacy on an annual basis. Uh, in the uh, article that uh, Nathan mentioned, Pressing Metal, Pressing Politics, I surveyed the annual medals of the 17th century beginning in 1605 under Paul V, uh, which uh, with the first confirmed annual medal, and ending in 1700 at the conclusion of Innocent XII's papacy, a reign that marked a distinct change in papal politics in advance of the 18th century. In this time, 10 popes released 93 annual medals. The production of annual medals was an exercise in identity creation, undertaken to advance the image of the Pope as an aristocratic prince in three specific roles, as builders, as warriors, and as impresarios, and thus establish popes as leading actors on Europe's political stage. The first annual medal may have been this one, issued by Nicholas V to commemorate the Jubilee of 1450. Thereafter, annual medals were issued on July 29th, uh, pardon me, June 29th of each year on the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul, one of the most important dates on the Roman calendar. The reverses commemorate an important event from the preceding year. For example, this medal from Innocent X that acknowledges the Peace of Westphalia that ended the Thirty Years' War. Images were rarely repeated on annual messages, on annual medals, and pastoral images almost never appear. Instead, annual medals proclaim official, specific, and timely political messages, and their size, number and value allowed for the deployment of a portable propaganda strategy. Medals were widely collected and annual medals were an opportunity to inject papal politics into the collective worldview of the power elite of early modern Rome. Though popes always claimed ecclesiastical authority, the image presented in the annual medals is that of the Pope as Renaissance prince and successor of the Roman emperors. The Reis uh, Gestae Dewi Augusti, for example, enumerates Augustus's achievements, including building projects from temples to aqueducts, the conduct of great wars, and sponsoring spectacles such as triumphs, gladiatorial games, and Almachia. Taken as a whole, 
the annual medals of the 17th century present the same image of the popes. They were magnificent builders. They were significant players in European affairs, specifically in terms of war and peace. And they presided over a city of spectacles. 17th century annual medals can be divided into these large categories. In this pie chart, we see blue represents architecture. Uh, red represents war and to a lesser extent, some peace. And green represents uh, spectacles. Oops, computer's running a little bit slowly there, right? But there's the green for uh, spectacles. Uh, for greater specificity, each category can be subdivided into smaller group. So, for example, jubilees and canonizations are subcategories uh, of spectacles. And there is obviously overlap. Urban VIII's Forte Urbano, commemorated on the annual medal from 1630, shown here, is architecture, but also a military enterprise. The most common message conveyed by the medals was that the popes were great builders who presided over a magnificent city. Of the 93 annual medals produced in the 17th century, 34 depict architectural projects. Uh, as early as the 15th century, the link between power and architecture was clear to Nicholas V. His biographer, Platina, records the pontiff asserting that only the learned who have studied the origins and development of the authority of the Roman church can really understand its greatness. Thus, to create solid and stable convictions in the minds of the uncultured masses, there must be something that appeals to the eye. A popular faith sustained only by doctrine will never be anything but feeble and vacillating. But if the authority of the Holy See were visibly displayed in majestic buildings, imperishable memorials, and witnesses seemingly planted by the hand of God himself, belief would grow and strengthen like a tradition from one generation to another, and all the world would accept and revere it. Noble edifices combining taste and beauty with imposing proportions would immens immensely conduce to the exaltation of the chair of St. Peter. Nicholas's well-known comment on prestige architecture linked papal power to the architecture and urbanism of the Eternal City for the next 250 years. During that time, the city was indeed transformed, a process that was recorded on papal medals that were distributed to European power elite. Many architects made contributions to the effort, but with the advent of the papacy of Urban VIII in 1623, the job increasingly fell to John Lorenzo Bernini. That medals were abundantly produced, widely distributed, and avidly collected indicates the importance of numismatic art. That architecture appears so frequently in numismatic art suggests that building was an important element of papal rule. And so the frequent appearance of Bernini's architecture on papal medals suggests the centrality of his work in the image of Rome projected by the papacy to the rest of Europe. At least 12 projects by Bernini were commemorated over, uh, on over 80 series. These projects include the unrealized apse for Santa Maria Maggiore, the Church of Santa Bibiana, the Ponte Sant'Angelo, the Porta del Popolo, the Four Rivers Fountain, the Elephant and Obelisk Memorial or Monument, the Church of Santa Maria del Assunzione in Ariccia, the modifications to the arsenal at Citta Vecchia, and a host of projects at St. Peter's, including the Baldacchino, the Catherine of Petri, 
the Scala Regia, and the Colonnade and Piazza. These projects could appear in different iterations, such as the Piazza San Pietro and Colonnade, you see here, or show up in the background of other events, uh, as was very common with the Baldacchino. A survey of these medals show the rise and fall of Bernini's career. In 1634, Urban VIII released a medal commemorating the recent completion of work conducted by Bernini at the Church of Santa Bibiana. The original Church of Santa Bibiana was built in the fifth century over the putative home and grave of the saint. But by the 17th century, the building was in need of repair. Renovations began at the church in 1624. During construction of the new high altar, the remains of the saint were discovered, thrilling Urban, who, as a poet of some note, wrote a celebratory poem in response. Meanwhile, Bernini carved a statue of the saint for the high altar and began work on a new facade for the building. The work at Santa Bibiana was undertaken in part because the building had strong ties to antiquity, while at the same time, the scope, scale, and visibility of the interventions marked the building as Barberini, the family of Urban VIII. Though the disabitato or the unoccupied of Renaissance, unoccupied sections of Renaissance Rome, uh, Santa Bibiana was located between Santa Maria Maggiore and the city gate leading to San uh, Lorenzo Fiori le Mura. Placing Santa Bibiana on an important conduit for pilgrims traversing the city during the 1625 Jubilee. Thus, Urban's dedication to veneration of saints, as well as his role as patron of architecture, were placed on prominent public display. A decade later, these same things were put, uh, were again put on display for a, a wider audience this time on a medal that commemorated the completion of the church's renovations. With the death of Urban VIII in 1644 and the elevation of Giovanni Battisti, Battista Pamphili as Pope Innocent X, Bernini began, as the shop-worn tale tells us, the most difficult phase of his career. Fallen from favor, Bernini struggled finding papal commissions, while other work, such as the bell towers, were sabotaged. Bernini ultimately triumphed over his rivals, conspiracies, and the indifference of popes through nothing more than the brilliance of his design for the Four Rivers Fountain. This important monument appeared on the annual medal of 1652, just one year after the Peace of Westphalia was recognized on a, uh, an earlier medal, the 1651 medal seen here, which features a passage from Psalm 122 that reads, Pax Virtute Tua, or peace be in thy strength. The beginning of a pilgrim's prayer for Jerusalem that emphasizes that peace and prosperity will be found within a city's strong walls and defensive towers. This passage appears with some frequency on papal medals and has generally been linked to papal militarism. In this case, it likely has specifically to do with the Treaty uh, of Westphalia, which ended the Thirty Years' War. Though Innocent X did not accept all elements of the treaty, he did recognize that it ended the war and accepted that some benefits came to the Catholic cause. Those benefits, including the return of South Central Europe to Catholicism, the exact area where the war largely started with the defenestration of Prague. The return of that land, it has been argued, is celebrated with the Four Rivers Fountain, with an image of the Danube River God, who reaches back to support the papal crest. More broadly, Genevieve Warwick has recently argued that Bernini's fountain transformed the piazza from a workaday space into a, quote, scenographic representation of papal power, end quote, 
a stage upon which was enacted the drama of post-Tridentine Catholic expansion across Europe and around the world. Composing a proper response to Westphalia was one of the most critical tasks undertaken by Innocent X. And if his fountain in Piazza Navona does indeed provide commentary on the state of Catholicism in 1650, then once again, Bernini was called on to give a central papal message prominent, a prominent display. And another papal medal was struck that spread knowledge of Bernini's effort. With Innocent's death in 1655 and the advent of the papacy of Alexander VII, Bernini reaches the halcyon days of his career. Of similar age and vision, Bernini and Alexander embarked on a building frenzy that swept up Rome and its environs. Alexander saw architecture as a means of asserting papal significance after Westphalia, and Bernini was the man to make it happen. One crucial event that combined Catholic propaganda and urbanism was the arrival in Rome of Queen of Queen Christina of Sweden in 1655. Her arrival in Rome was feted as a triumph of the Catholic Church and the papacy, and Alexander VII commemorated the event on a medal the next year. She officially entered Rome on December 23rd via the Porta del Popolo, the inner facade of which Bernini had recently built and which boasts an inscription written by Alexander himself, which reads, to happy and blessed entry in the year of our Lord, 1655. Part of that inscription appears on the medal, as you can see. Bernini's work converted the piazza into another performative space in which Christina's arrival became another act in the long drama of Catholic and Protestant antagonism. Alexander kept Bernini busy outside of Rome as well, commissioning the architect to build the Church of Santa Maria dell'Assunzione in Ariccia and to expand the arsenal at Citta Vecchia. Perhaps Bernini's most important work for Alexander, however, uh, was at St. Peter's. It is at that church that Bernini built the colonnade around Piazza San Pietro, the Cathar de Petri in the apse, and the Scala Regia that links the church to the Vatican Palace. All of these projects were commemorated on medals issued by Alexander VII. Though there was a frenzy of church building in early modern Rome, St. Peter's was in many ways the most important as it was simultaneously a symbol of the ancient imperial church of Constantine, while also a beacon of the resurgent post-Tridentine Catholic Church. The centrality of St. Peter's is reflected in commemorative medals, with dozens of them depicting the basilica's construction and ornamentation. Bernini had already executed a work at the uh, basilica, the Baldacchino, built for Urban VIII and seen in this medal from 1624. The Baldacchino, as mentioned before, appears on numerous medals, uh, notably those that depict canonizations. The Council of Trent unleashed a wave of canonizations that rolled through the 17th century and the elaborate ceremonies involved with canonization culminated under Bernini's Baldacchino. By the end of Alexander's reign in 1667, the grand vision of Rome envisioned by Nicholas V two and a half centuries earlier had been realized through the combined efforts of over 30 popes and countless artists and architects. Alexander's additions were the crowning achievements, yet his building campaigns contributed in no small part to the dire financial straits in which the papacy was left after his reign. After Alexander, major architectural expenditures diminished to a trickle 
as the papacy flirted with bankruptcy. Still, Bernini was put to work. Bernini's biographers tell us that on the first day of his pontificate, Clement VII summoned Bernini and handed him a commission. One early and important project was the Pont San Angelo, uh, seen here in a medal from 1669. As Todd Martyr notes, Bernini's work at the bridge consisted of more than just the angels. It involved expanding the Piazza San Celso to create a view of the bridge and the castle. As for Bernini's angels, Mark Wheel also notes uh, that implements of Christ's passion reasserted the importance of the Mass and Eucharist, a chief concern after Trent, and another example of Bernini's role in communicating official papal messages. But perhaps not all was well with Bernini. By the papacy of Clement IX, Bernini was only a few years past his failed trip to Paris, and as in France, enemies now circled the Cavaliere in Rome. Bernini was looking for a major project in Rome to reassert himself as the preeminent architect in the city. Such a chance came with Clement's proposal to expand and embellish the apse of Santa Maria Maggiore. Medals were struck depicting Bernini's plan, as we see here. The story of the new apse centers almost entirely on the finances for Bernini's grand plan. Bernini may have had Clement's ear, as he had had with Alexander VII, but Clement did not have Alexander's purse. The end of Bernini's time as architectural impresario of Rome followed hard on the heels of the death of Clement IX in 1669. The new pope, Clement X, was uninterested in Bernini's sweeping plans for Santa Maria Maggiore and instead opted for a less ambitious project, ultimately brought to completion by Carlo Rinaldi, seen here in a medal from 1672. A comparison of these medals illustrates the difference in the scale of the plans. Despite the fact that his glory began to fade even before he died, John Lorenzo Bernini is still arguably the most significant Roman artist. There really is no one else whose art and architecture were as influential in the long artistic history of the city and across so many artistic media as is suggested in this medal from 1674. Yet it is perhaps his architecture that is the most significant to papal politics and uh, papal political and spiritual aspirations, as is attested to the fact that his architectural projects appear more frequently in papal numismatic art than any other architect. As these medals entered the collections of the elite of Europe, they helped to spread Bernini's fame across the continent. Simultaneously, the medals inserted papal messages into the collective political consciousness of Europe. Meanwhile, the medals indicated that on the ground in Rome, popes consistently called upon Bernini to execute some of their most important architectural commissions, ones that were loaded with ideological and visual significance. This fact attests to Bernini's importance without recourse to the rhetoric employed by Bernini's biographers and is the true basis for Bernini's fame. At the end of his own biography of Bernini, Franco Mormondo imagines Domenico Bernini insisting that his father needs no more a monument than the city of Rome itself. And in this, he is correct. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Matt. That was, yeah. that was really informative, really great. And you know, I don't think we get uh, Renaissance medals quite enough on our uh, long tables. So you gave us something different and new as well. So uh, Happy with to. that, uh, any questions from anyone? Maybe stop sharing your screen so we can see everybody, but any 
Any questions or comments for Matt? Did that end the uh, sharing? Yeah, that did. Okay. There are some questions in the chat. Perhaps I can look at those uh, sure. first. Sure. Uh, well, I didn't know how to remove that. So that didn't get removed. Sorry, Emma. Uh, okay. How many metals exist today? Well, I have no idea. I mean, there are hundreds of them. Um, any series could produce, especially if we're thinking about like the totality of papal uh, metals um, from perhaps beginning in the, you know, the early 15th century, and they're still making the metals today. Um, so, I mean, there would just be hundreds of series and, you know, just thousands and thousands of individual metals. Uh, I don't know that. It's a good question. People often ask about this. They want to know about the distribution of these metals. And, you know, I just haven't done the work. I don't know how, how, how long it would take to do it. I suppose we could look for representative samples and think about distribution uh, from that. But I guess the point I'd like to make, I think the people, why people ask, like, how many of these were there and how many people would have seen it is it's that question, like, who would have even seen these things? And I think one way to rem remind ourselves of that is a lot of the art that we see in art history textbooks, or even now, if you go to Rome and you visit these places, a lot of this art was in private collections. So no one would have seen these things. Uh, you would have been pretty elite. Far and away, all this art is much more visible uh, today. And I think the fact that a lot of this art is injected into private collections also makes it significant. Again, for us, we don't think about it, but like, Every print and drawing, all these collections of prints and of architectural views from uh, Piranesi and all these others, uh, these metals were often a part of that. Again, they could be of humble material. I mean, you like to show the gold ones, but the bronze ones were pretty common too. Um, and so they would have shown up everywhere and there would have been a robust uh, discussion of them. So I, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have all these numbers. Um, uh, someone could track it down for us. <laughs> Uh, but the point is, I, I, I guess the upshot is we should be aware that a lot of people saw these and they were definitely part of a larger discussions that, you know, the elite would have had. Um, let's see, what's, were papal metals struck in the same mint that produced papal circulating coinage? I don't know. Um, there were a couple of different artists that would have uh, produced these. And so some of these would have been in their own workshop. Um, so yeah, uh, were they collected by Protestants on the Grand Tour? Yes. So the one um, diarist that I mentioned him, I think John mm -hmm. Evelyn is, that's exactly uh, who he is. And we get a great sort of Protestant take on the excessive, uh, the excesses of, um, you know, the, the uh, Catholic church. Um, he loves to describe in detail the processions through the city and these, canonizations and I mean Rome was a city of these processions I mean the city would have been shut down about every week um, for some feast day <laughs> when something like Queen Christina shows up that I mean they the Pope literally orders the city to be shut down uh, to celebrate her arrival but there would have been confraternities that process through the city um, we, there's all these I mean you go all the way back to Dante's description of um, Rome, the streets are just jam-packed, congested with pilgrims um, and so forth. And anyway, so yeah, Evelyn and the others um, were interested in this. And even though John Evelyn and other particularly English um, visitors really decry the um, Baroque style, uh, and we really see it show up in 18th century commentary, they were still kind of fascinated with the excesses of it. So they collected all sorts of stuff from Rome. Uh, kind of whatever they could. So, but the metals are a big part of it, but also across Italy uh, as well. So they would have done that. Um, a citation here. Thank you. Yes, I'll, I'll take a look for that. Fabrizio, yes, thank you. Other questions, you know, you can just ask. Uh, we don't have to uh, uh, just go with the chat box, but. 
where did you get the illustrations for uh, this talk? Well, most of these can just be found online, actually. Um, but I've done some um, publishing of these. So I've also got um, some of these, about half of these probably came from the Vatican itself. Uh, I did publish a paper with uh, a the uh, uh, the AJN. And so y'all provided actually some of these uh, for me. So the ones on Urban the Eighth and the Barberini uh, in particular. But it's amazing how easy these things are to find. They're all over Wikipedia. There are, um, and it, it's a, it's all when a publishing is harder than, you know, something like this, but there are a lot of places where these show up for sale. Uh, you can get them now. I know Nathan has been really active in trying to uh, have sort of, uh, you know, advocate for ethical buying and selling of these, but at a minimum, they do show up a lot on the internet. They're pretty uh, Googleable. Do we have any other uh, questions or comments for Matt? Uh, in terms of how many survive, um, if you're just talking about the century or so uh, that was emphasized in the talk, um, I would say, including the restrikes, tens of thousands. You know, they are literally that common. And the restrikes are with the original dies and they use them until they shattered and you can actually see the progression of the die deterioration you can see them ready to just split yeah that's right um and then of course there's also coinage actual currency that were produced so uh and at least for some of those you you'll get maybe they're more rudimentary, but you get a lot of the same imagery. As one of the things that's kind of neat about the annual medals, those are pretty specific kinds of images. Um, but yeah, I think Alan's right. I mean, just overwhelming quantity quantities of these things. There's, hi, this is Eric Engstrom. There's a wonderful uh, satirical piece by Ronald Searle, the British Art Medal Society. I don't know if you want to mention that. Uh, yeah, I'll take a look for it. That, that sounds interesting, sure. Uh, Jesse wants to weigh in on the mint. Yes, please do. Yes. Hello, uh, Mike. I do have a, a, an answer to your question. First of all, Matt, that was an excellent, excellent uh, presentation. Thank you so much. As Nathan had mentioned, uh, this is on the more modern side, even though the, the topic was still several hundred years old. Most of our topics are thousands of years old. And as a modernist, I appreciate that. Uh, but as far as Mike's question goes, is uh, if these were made in the same mint as the coins, uh, they were. Uh, beginning in the uh, mid 15th century, the mint was actually located outside of the Vatican across the river. Uh, and it was Pope uh, Alexander VII's Chi, um, who was kind of obsessed with metals and um, uh, employed Bernini on many, many, many occasions. Uh, he moved the mint into the gardens of the uh, of the Vatican and made the coins and the medals directly inside the gardens. Um, so yeah, they were made in the same place. And I think it was, yeah, yeah, I think it was a French ambassador to um, to the Vatican actually noted that this pope in particular was more obsessed with medals than he was with civic. Uh, duties and everything like that. So he really was obsessed with them and, and you know, was heavily involved with the mint. And I think all the minting equipment was originally thought to have been made by Bernini, but now it's thought to have been made by Bernini's brother, Luigi Bernini, who uh, was a, a water architect. So. Thank yeah, you. Luigi did a lot of sort of the technical aspects of Bernini's ideas. Bernini's he dreamed up the ideas and sold them to people. And then he had other people kind of actually uh, do a lot of the, the technical stuff. No, that's fascinating. Thanks for letting me know. Yeah, that's, that's, that seems to track with who Alexander was. They often describe, you know, Bernini and Alexander were about the same age. They both grew up really in the Vatican. Um, Bernini is an architect, obviously. And, uh, Alexander is a prelate, but they, we have their, um, drawings and notebooks. We can see sketches and notes in both of their handwriting. Uh, there are these stories and probably, you know, possibly true 
possibly made up, but that like they would spend late night talking about these projects and the Pope would actually fall asleep and Bernini would put out the lights and put, tuck him in and, and, and uh, uh, duck out. But yeah, for sure, Alexander's interests were, I mean, a lot of the older, the earlier interests of the papacy just weren't as available anymore after the 30 years war. And, uh, but yeah, Alexander is a major and very important patron of the arts. And as we see, yeah. So that's fascinating. I did not know that. That's great. Yeah, you had actually just mentioned how, you know, Bernini was kind of selling his ideas to people. I was actually wondering uh, how involved he was with the die cutting process. I don't know if you came across anything as far as that goes, but, you know. I don't know. I, I really don't. Um, I know that he's he did design some coins. I just didn't bring the, them in. Um, I, I, you know, Bernini was the head of a massive business. I mean, even calling it a workshop isn't is I don't think it's the scale gets to the scale of just what all uh, Bernini was involved in. I mean, we're talking about making art, carving statues, painting portraits, painting pictures, building buildings, running you know the aqueducts, building fountains. He also um, wrote plays, acted in those. He's also hanging out with the elites of you know Rome and Europe, just talking about stuff. Um, he's just a shockingly busy um, figure. And so much of this is documented. I and mean, we can see um, almost at a you know, really granular level, uh, his really his day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week or monthly, month-to-month -month, uh, activities there. Um, so I don't know that he would have really been that involved with the, making the medals. Uh, he, may, he may have had ones that they preferred. You know, I'm sorry, I, I, I just don't know, but uh, I get the feeling just, I guess this is, I thought this is maybe isn't specific about the medals, but just sort of my feeling about Bernini is that he dreamed up the ideas and he gave it to other people to execute. Um, some of his sculpture, he might do it at the end and certainly early in his career, he's doing that last stuff. But by, by the time, you know, we get to the 1550s and stuff, I mean, he's building churches everywhere and running aqueducts. And uh, I mean, he just would have been really busy. So I don't know how much actual art he was making anymore. Other questions? Anyone? Yes. I was asking if anyone else had anything. Um, I have a question. It might be um, it might be a kind of question you can't really answer, but it's something I've been thinking about. And it really has nothing to do directly with your presentation either, but you know, as you pointed out at some point, uh, this phenomenon of architectural representation on coinage really begins with the Romans. And even today, um, institutional collecting or private collecting, you'll find architectural representations, you know, kind of a favorite topic, uh, overrepresented in collections based on what actual finds in antiquity were. Uh, they were actually pretty uncommon in antiquity, maybe three, four percent at most at any given time of the images in circulation. So our modern interest in architecture on coinage really begins in this period you're talking about, the Renaissance and the Baroque and the early modern period, when there's a lot of interest in Roman coins and especially architectural representations. So I'm wondering, is there something in in that world uh, where they're uh, wanting to see themselves in the Roman, what it, in the Romans, what is it that they, why, why are they projecting so much interest in architecture and the built environment, particularly back onto the past? Well, I think a big part of it is that there's so much Roman architecture still in the city and they are actively discovering this stuff. And the architecture, um, it's of a scale and a venerability that really no other city in Europe can claim. I mean, Florence is a really fancy, wealthy, um, and beautiful city in the 15th, 16th centuries. Paris and London are growing, Naples, but there is just isn't any place that can claim that kind of architectural history that a city like Rome has. So that's pretty obvious. But the papacy is also asserting um, authority over Rome and we, I think today the common impression is, well, yeah, there were the Pope, there were the emperors, and then the popes come along, and the popes kind of rule Rome um, until, well, 1870, you know, when, uh, 
you know, the, the, the Republic is declared. But that's not really true. Those thousand years or so between Constantine and really the Renaissance, it's century to century, uh, whether or not there's actually papal authority. And so the popes are looking for a way of asserting um, authority because even their religious authority is being challenged at this time. Of course, we talk about things like the Reformation, but the Reformation was hardly anything unusual. What was unusual is that it was so successful. Uh, but people had always been challenging the authority. The conciliar movement literally put uh, Martin V on the throne in 1417. And so throughout the uh, 15th century, we see those struggles for religious authority. But at the same time, there's, an, there's a struggle for um, secular authority. If the popes are the leaders of the church, okay, fine. But why are they secular uh, leaders? And so that history actually had to be sort of concocted. We see Dante complaining about it, saying shouldn't have done that. Um, but it it strike, it's it reaches back to forgeries like the so-called donation of Constantine, um, which we know now is an eighth, probably ninth, somewhere around you know Carolingian era forgery that claims that Constantine on his deathbed bequeathed the empire to uh, Pope Sylvester, which you know obviously. Even in the Renaissance, they knew it was a fake. They could, uh, they could tell, but they need something that links them to that. Like so, even if that donation is for a forgery, the idea is the same. And we can see when we look at the papacy, the Pope is the Pontifex Maximus, right? The uh, College of Cardinals is the Curia. Um, so they really sort of try to embrace that element. But what's a visual symbol for this claim? If you want to suggest the venerability of not just Christianity, but specifically the Roman church, what better thing than the architecture uh, of Rome? The architecture of Rome links the popes uh, to this, this dual um, authority of religious and uh, uh, political uh, authority. Uh, I should point out that it's only it's of the metals that uh, you know I talk about here in the 17th century. It's about a third of them are um, architecture, so I guess that's much more than in antiquity. Um, but um, uh, so, but anyway, that would be one explanation. The other thing is, I think people just like architecture. Uh, it's cool looking. You can imagine this stuff. You know, we have um, uh, people love these drawings. Uh, they're they're a hot seller as well. And so this I don't know as much about. I re really don't know anything about it. But when we look at all these prints and drawings of Rome um, that are sold like on in mass, even then and even today, architecture is a big part of it. Hey, go to a, a, a Go to a gift shop in Rome and buy a postcard. What, what's it going to be of? You know, it's going to be that place. So I think that that the idea of place and space weighs into why that's such a um, an important um, uh, subject. Why architecture is so important? Um, and the architecture shows up in all the literature. Look at Petrarch. Uh, you know, when he's talking about being in Rome, he's in these these venerable, these ancient imperial spaces, and he can lament its decline and fall. There's a romantic sort of um, nostalgia um, with the way that Rome is uh, is viewed. So, um, or maybe they just, those are the, the metals that they found most interesting. I don't know this, again, I'm only speculating, perhaps some of the ancient metals that they saw, they couldn't, they didn't really know what it meant or was ter too erudite or uh, you know, they may not have known as clearly as the architecture. And we do know that when they encountered something that they found like an older depiction or an older description, uh, when they actually find it in Rome, it's a big deal. One of the big, big cultural er events of the early 16th century um, is when they discovered the Loacuan uh, because they knew about it from plenty. And then when they found it, they're like, oh my God, it's real. Michelangelo rushes down and everyone's talking about it. it it's really this huge cultural event. So perhaps there's something like that, um, just sort of fascination. Um, but yeah, no, I don't know. I don't know. It's a good question. Architecture is cool. Maybe that's all there is. Could I be as simple as that. Yeah. Architecture is awesome. I think that's why we, I like to study it. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. 
And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.